Vatya. Yes, good morning. Good morning, Vatya. Vatya, do you have any questions? Maybe a few after. <laughs> So, so it's coming, it's coming. Okay. Alisa. Elena, good morning. Leia. Good morning. Rojo Hanna. Good morning. Where did your name is? Tired. Ronnie. Good morning. Good morning. Where did your name go? It's not on the paper list. Why not? Because there's such a thing over to electronics. I don't know. You don't know? If you don't know, I surely don't know. What is it? Uh, bomb, something bomb. Rosen. Ruben? Rosen bomb. Rosen, Rosen bomb. I know there was a bomb in it. I can't remember your name. I can remember Sharon, but then you always say, no, that's not your name. <laughs> what? Hannah. Hannah? Hannah. What's your last name, Hannah? Ruben. Oh, that's there. There, that's Ruben. Now I'll remember, hopefully. Okay, just to remind you, new students, this is the daily assignment, is to look upward, and take a look at what's going on upstairs. Remember that something over us, higher than ourselves, is very much the lesson of these days of Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim, that when that the lesson Hashem wanted to plant, implant in our minds and hearts, that would be constantly something we're aware of. You know, like you're aware you have to breathe. You're aware you have to eat. That's how this lesson has to become part and parcel of yourself of ourselves. And that is not that Hashem is the creator of the world and everything in the world gets its life from him. That's not the lesson. Non-Jews know that too. Pharaoh knew that. He just said that that was him. He is the God who gives life, life to everything. So therefore, Hashem appeared to Moshe for the first time. When did, you know, it's an interesting thing. Abraham, Hashem spoke to Adam. It says that Adam and Chava, after they ate from the forbidden fruit, they heard the voice of Hashem going through the garden. And they hid. Hashem spoke to them. How did he appear? Doesn't say. They saw, it says what, what they heard, doesn't say what they saw. Hashem spoke to Noyach, told him, you are a righteous person in, our, in your generation. Build me an ark with so much, so much, so many dimensions, Three, 600 feet long, 100 feet wide, 60 feet high, with compartments for all the animals. That's what Hashem said to Noah. Noah heard Hashem say these things. 
It doesn't say what Hashem what Loich saw. Hashem spoke to Avram. He told him, go, get out of this place. You don't belong here. There's an evil place of idol worship. Go, go find yourself. Lech lecha. And he spoke to Yitzchok. And he spoke to Yaakov. Yaakov tells us what we say he saw. He saw a dream. He saw angels in the dream. But when it doesn't say anywhere what when Hashem spoke to the to our prophets who are the, the fathers of our people, it doesn't say what he, how he appeared to them. Until Moshe. When did Hashem appear to Moshe for the first time? Every schoolgirl knows this. A Hebrew schoolgirl. Uh, Even reform school. What? In, bush. In, what bush? The, uh, Morris Bush? Yeah. President Bush? <laughs> the burning bush. Yes. The burning bush. Hashem appeared in a burning bush. So what's so special about the bush that's caught fire? It didn't burn. It, didn't burn. it burned and it didn't burn. So it was a bush that was burning. That's perfectly natural. Anybody sees a bush, they know that the bush is created by God. It gets light from God. And it's burning, the fire is from God. But it didn't burn up. Oh, that's not the God that we know. That's higher than nature. And that's how Hashem, that's what Hashem revealed when he took us out of Egypt. He revealed that he's a God in nature and he's not in nature. He's a creator of nature also. So the, tenth, the first seven plagues destroyed nature. The power and the might of Egypt was the power of nature. They were the richest country in the world. They were the most powerful country in the world. And one by one by one, all their might and their power was taken away from them, was shattered. Until the wise men of Egypt came to Pharaoh and said, don't you realize, your majesty, that Egypt is destroyed? Right? That's what we read last week. Mm -hmm. The plague of the firstborn was not natural. It didn't come at a certain time. It came at a moment. It was exactly midnight. Now, here's a philosophical question for you girls who never studied philosophy. I never studied philosophy. I was afraid to go there as a college student. I didn't want them to ask me about questions they ask in philosophy, like, what is God? I didn't have no clue, and I didn't want to have to lie. What is midnight? When is it? Is it before 12? Is it after 12? When is midnight? It's not. There's no moment when it is. It divides between four before midnight and after midnight, but it is higher than the whole concept of time. And that's the same idea as the, of the, of the burning bush. It's in time, but it's not in time. It contains all time. You want to tell me about midnight? It's already gone. You want to look at it? It's past. You want to look at it? It's not here yet. When are we going out? Midnight. They have a thing here in New York, a midnight, New Year's Eve. They have a ball or something on a, some high building, and at midnight, the ball goes down. But either before midnight, it doesn't happen. After midnight, it already happens. And when a all the plagues, the seven plagues took a week. But they took a month. One month, Moshe was warning Pharaoh. One week, Moshe was warning Pharaoh. The second week, the plague was taking place. The third week was recovery. Maybe I'm missing a week in there, but each, each plague was a week. The plague of the f death of the firstborn was a split second. It wasn't a week long. 
which is one second, and the whole of Egypt was devastated. Until this plague, Pharaoh was always in his palace, in his throne room, the mighty ruler. In the plague of, of the killing of the firstborn, Pharaoh, who was a firstborn, went running through the streets, ran out of his palace, was running through the streets with no guards and no entourage that goes with the king everywhere. Where's Moshe? Where's Aaron? Screaming. And the children played, says in the Medrash, children played tricks on him. They said, he's there. He became totally our ice king. It was a split second. It was out of time. It was a moment in time that was out of time. That's the whole point. Just like the bush was burning and it wasn't burning. Which, by the way, is the same thing as the miracle of Hanukkah, which was uh, that it lasted eight days. How did it last eight days? It burned and it didn't burn. If you're going to say the oil burns slowly, that's not the mitzvah. It has to be natural oil. As they say, just a little bit at a time. The cups had to be full. So it burned and it didn't burn. It's the only solution. That Hashem, and this is the idea of Hasidus, which was taught by the Baal Shem Tov, that the world is constantly being created out of nothing. And that's how Hashem revealed himself to us in Egypt. Now, this week is going to happen again with the splitting of the Red Sea. That Hashem is going to split the Red Sea to teach us what this means, that he's in time, he's in space, he's in the world, and he's not in the world. He's going to change the sea, which is water, into stone. He's going to change the muddy seabed, seabed into the I-90, into a highway. People didn't, you don't think about that, do you? He's going to walk through the sea. What's, what's it going to be like? Is it going to be muddy? Mountains, valleys. How are they going to get their, 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 all their animals through? And, and oh, it's, 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 and the, if, can you imagine how strong the wind must be to, uh, let's say you have a bathtub and you have an air, a, a blow dryer. How strong does that blow dryer have to be to actually split the water in your bathtub? Do you have a, do you have a, could you use it on your hair? No. You blow your head off. How strong must the wind be to split an ocean? An ocean, not the Nile River. The Nile River was like a lake. It was like, like a big lake, like Ontario. You know, it's 32 miles across. They swim across Lake Ontario. It was a big, it was a big, big, they sailed, it was like sail, sailboats. There, there were boats sailing on the Nile. It was a big river. The Red Sea was much bigger. It was an ocean. How strong a wind would it take to split an ocean? Okay, we can understand very strong winds. If the wind was that strong, how in the world did so many millions of people, men and women, children, young and old, go through there with their animals and their suitcases? How, how, how could they do it? Because it was the same thing as Avraham, when Nimrod threw Avraham into the fiery furnace, he didn't get burned up. And they saw through the trans, transparent walls, I don't know what kind of material they had, that it didn't melt down, and they could see that inside he was walking around with other people. Because he was experiencing Gan Eden, and it, he was experiencing a, a, a higher than nature experience with angels. And the, the servants of Nimrod who had to uh, take care of the furnace, they were, they were burned up. So this is the, the, this is the point of how God reveals himself to us in this most special way and establishes a relationship with us that is unlike any other. That our relationship with Hashem is a relationship with Hashem as he is the creator of the world and as he is higher than the world in, in, entirely and bringing the world into existence out of nothing. Now we have to take a little bit of intent, attendance. 
for people who came in. Here is uh, Shoshana Hasid yeah. came in. Good morning. And Leah. No, I wasn't here. Yeah, I took your attendance, Rahul Khanna. I said you, I said, called your name. So who else came in? That's it. Gianna, Gianna. I knew, I knew some, yeah, I, I marked you as, as you came in. Oh. Is this Rivka? Yeah. Hello. Good morning, Rivka. Thank you for coming. Okay. Chapter seven. We've been learning that about clippers. Clipper is a metaphor for the hiding of godliness. How does God hide? So that there can be a world in which there's good and bad and, and, the, and we can choose the good. And he commands us to choose the good and he gives us the power and the strength and the intellect and the heart to be able to choose good and to overcome any obstacles. The obstacles are there in order to, that we should achieve something. You know, we have a famous rent-a-car company here in America called Hertz, and they have their competition, which is Avis. Everybody knows this, what's Avis slogan? We try harder. In the communist world, there isn't competition. It's just the government. So people don't try harder. The point of competition is that it brings out the best in people. It leads to progress. So therefore, Hashem wants us to try hard to be connected to him. Because in order for there to be a world, he has to hide. And in this hiding, hiding how does he do it? He, he hides himself with clippers. A banana hides inside a banana peel. An orange hides within the orange. You don't see the orange, you don't see the banana, you see the, the outside. Peanuts hide inside peanut shells. Walnuts hide inside walnut shells. And Hashem hides inside nature. Nature is a creation. And the point of the creation is, since Hashem is hidden, we can choose to connect to him. If a person comes, like, you know, in the, in the mafia, they make you an offer that you cannot refuse. They hold a gun to your head. You say, yeah, sure, I want to. I need, sure, I need the insurance. You know, Mr. Raskin here on the, the fish store, when he opened this fish store, they came to him and they offered him insurance. He said, I don't need insurance. I have insurance, thank you. He said, you're sure you don't need insurance? He said, no, I don't think I need insurance. The next day, the whole glass on the store was broken. Oh they came, oh, terrible. Maybe you'd like to buy some insurance. That's how it works. Wow. <clears throat> So Hashem creates clippers so that we should make the right choice. Not because we want the insurance, but because we want to be connected to that which is true and right and good. And not to connect to that which is selfish and cruel and destructive. So therefore, in the world of clippers, we have two levels. A creative level that we can work with, and the uh, selfish level that is destructive. So that is called Klippus Noga, which is the creative level, which is the world of the permissible. Anything that we're allowed to do just for fun or for health reasons, 
as long as it's kosher, is from a clip of snoka. But if it's destructive or it's just simply not allowed, then we're not allowed. The, the Torah tells us don't go there because that's going to contaminate your, your mind and your sensitivity and your awareness. Now, Klippus Noga is what we're learning about. Page 116, starting at the top. So in the world of Klippus, we have two levels. And we learned that this corresponds like an opposite mirror image, a negative mirror image of the world of holiness. Then in the worlds of holiness, we have the highest level, which is godliness, which is pure godliness. But then we can't function there because that's like when there's a, a, a someone's holding a gun to your head and you're going to do whatever they say. So if godliness is revealed, you can't choose to do something against Torah or mitzvahs. If you see the light of Torah, you see the light of holiness, you can't choose anything else. So therefore the light has to be hidden. So we have three hidden worlds called the worlds of creation, where it's a little hidden, the world of formation where it's more hidden, and the world in which we live in which the light of godliness is almost entirely hidden. And here's where we function. This is where we function. I saw something very, very interesting just yesterday in, from the Alter Rebbe. He writes the story that, that Rivka, Rivka was the wife of Yitzchak. She had twin sons, Yaakov and Esau. And, and Yitzchak wanted to give Esau this big bracha because he was the first child of the twins who was born. And she knew that he was too wild and cruel and selfish to have such a bracha given to him, it would be destructive beyond measure. But Yitzchak wanted to give him a bracha because he was very, very powerful, and he felt that he would be a great warrior for Mashiach. He was wrong. Well, he was wrong at least then. And Yaakov was much more settled and serious, and Rivka knew that that's where the bracha had to go. So she took Esau's clothes and gave them to Yaakov so that Yitzchak would not recognize him. He says, my father, he's going to recognize me. He's going to curse me. She said, we'll, we'll see what we can do to avoid that. What that really stands for is that the energy, the spiritual energy that was invested in Esau was so high that it was uncontrollable. And in order to be controlled, you needed to have the stability of, ya of Yaakov. So she gave Esau's clothes to Yaakov, that he put on Esau's clothes, and he went into Yitzchok for the bracha, and Yitzchok feels him, and he feels the hairy clothes, and he says, the hands are the hands of Esau, but the voice is the voice of Yaakov. Because Yaakov spoke words of kindness and holiness, and Esau was like an animal. So we have in Klippa, the point is, very, very high spiritual energy that fell down into Klippa, into this wild, chaotic level that cannot hold the energy. And this is given into the hands of Klippus Noga that through Torah we can use that energy and elevate it into holiness. But if you give it to without the Torah, you get the mafia. Okay, page 118. Klippus Noga is, we, we see now, like an intermediary, an in-between level between holiness that's above it and the impurity, which is below it. Is that clear? Anybody not understand what I'm saying? Should I say it again? Do I hear a yes? Yes. Okay.
we have four levels in holiness. Creation, formation, action. Hiddenness here is no hiddenness. Here is partial hiddenness. Here, half hidden. The light is half hidden. Here, the light is almost completely hidden. Like the full moon, the quarter moon, the half moon, and the three quarter moon, or the light, the waning moon, the waxing moon. Okay. So we are here. Angels are here. Higher ranks of angels are here. And Hashem is here. One is Hashem. One is Hashem. One is Hashem in the heavens and the earth. Okay, four levels. Now we have the opposite mirror image of Klippa. So on the highest level, we have Klippa's Noga. Klippa's Noga is, if we could we maybe put it down here. This is Klippa's Noga. Here we have also four levels. Clippus Noga is like level number one. It's an intermediary. So the things from Clippus Noga have the potential to go up and be used for holiness, to become part of holiness. Like when you have a, a drink and you say a shahako niabidbara, you declare, you let you make a declaration. This is the creation of God. He creates everything by his word. So then you elevate the sparks. All right, sparks hidden here. Because clipper is the peel, the orange peel, the apple peel, the banana peel. It hides the walnut shell. It hides the light, what's in it. So Noga is this area where the, you have light, it's hidden, but it's not hidden so completely. So therefore you can take this light and the light can go up with you however high you can go. Wherever you are, whatever your kavan, your, your level of concentration could be, that's how high it can go. And we uniquely return these sparks to their source. When we say brachas, when we do mitzvahs, that's what it's all about. So there, here we have this level of, of noga, which is an intermediary but between noga and the three levels of impurity. They're what just called the levels of impurity. Tuma. Word in Hebrew for it is Tuma. Impurity. This is where you get all the transgressions. Don't worship idol worship, the biggest Tuma of all. To say that there's no God. I get my, as I get my life from God, I say I get my life without a fire. Idol worship. Murder. Theft. Obscenity. War, murder, it all, all comes from here. Snakes and scorpions, impure, all, all the impure foods. And certain things we don't understand why they're impure. Like if you have a gar, mixtures, mixtures are impure. You know, like you, you can mix uh, milk and sugar with your coffee, but you can't mix milk and meat. 
The Torah doesn't like mixtures. So Noga is an intermediary level that it's not holy, but it could be holy. It's not unholy, but if it's not used properly, when we do something that's against the Torah, the Torah tells us don't do it, then the light from Noga gets pulled down, pulled under by the undertow into the three levels of impurity, which are an inverse uh, level to the, to the four levels, the four worlds of purity, which all come from the four levels, the four letters of the name of God. Rabbi, so the Noga is giving to the Holiness question permission and action and the power, right? Just a... There's an apple. Hey, I have one of those too. You eat it, you say a brocha, you take the sparks of hope, the apple's getting light from God. God is giving life to this apple. Mm -hmm. You eat it, you say a brocha, you take the life up. Ah, okay, 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 okay. Eat it, you don't say the bracha. Go down. Okay. It's up to you. Right. The Hashem puts the whole world in our hands. Okay, page 116. Now, Klippus Noga is an intermediate category. It's intermediate, it's in the middle. Between three impure Klippus. See it? And... The order of sanctity, what well, in Hebrew that's Kedusha, sanctity is Kedusha, holiness. And Sholish Klippus is three impure Klippus. Lochein, therefore, sometimes, Pamim, Shinichlelis, Sholish Klippus Atomeus, sometimes the life from Klippus Noga will be pulled down into the three impure levels. As explained in Eitz Chaim, who wrote Eitz Chaim? Chaim Vital. Vital. He put his name in the title. At the beginning of chapter four, in the quoting from the Zohar. Who wrote the Zohar? Yes. Good. And at other times, Klippus Noga will be elevated and go up into worlds of holiness. Okay? Tahainu. What does this mean? That in the thing from Klippus Noga, there's goodness. We have in this apple, we have sparks. My writing is, I can't write backwards. I guess. We have sparks of life in the apple. And these sparks give us energy. That's why when you don't eat for a long time, you're so weak. You need the sparks. They give you energy. The holier you are, you're able to elevate these sparks to a much higher level. You don't need that much because you're getting the energy from its source. So you can see with your eyes that the Rebbe comes and teaches for four hours straight without a note. Unbelievable. And what does he eat? As a one little piece of cake and maybe a little a, a, a drink of wine. And at the end, he's full of energy. Everybody who's trying to listen to him is exhausted. And he's full of energy. No. You got it? Yeah. So that we elevate the spark, these sparks, return, we return them to their source in holiness. Dino. Third Hebrew lines on page 116. What's going on? 
Because we have in the, the, the object or the activity from Klippus Noiga, we have good. Good is from Hashem. Good is holiness. And it's all mixed up. It's mingled in this thing that the thing hides godliness. You look at an apple, you don't see God. You see an apple. And if you're hungry, you say, mmm, mmm. Well, what's saying, mm, mm, that's, is that your animal soul or is that your godly soul? A lot, it's probably your animal soul. But you remember to say a bracha because you were taught to say a bracha. And therefore, the bracha kicks in and you're able to extract those sparks from the mm, mm, which is selfish, into mm-hmm. Return the life to Hashem. You know what it means to have such a kavana to do it, to eat an apple for the sake of a mitzvah? I'll tell you this story and this is going to be the end of the class. Um, there was a young man who made friends with me. He was very talented reader from the Torah. He was, he was a great, he was so talented, he was so good that he told me he used to deliberately make mistakes in reading the Torah and shul so that people would stay awake. Because otherwise he read, he read pretty prep, um, you know, very, so perfectly that people would sort of not pay attention. So he used to make mistakes to, so that they would pay attention. And I made friends with him and he wanted to be, he wanted to learn with me. I said, why do you want to learn with me? He wanted to learn with me. So we learned together and then he got sick. We learned together for a year and then he got sick and the sickness raced through his body and his lungs were filled with disease and he couldn't breathe. And I went to visit him on Lag Ba'oymer with my three-year-old son. It was his birthday, it was his birthday was two days before that. And I came to him with my son that he should cut his hair. I came into his house and he was leaning on his dining room table like this with his head against the table. And there were two people from Bikr Harlem sitting with him to keep him company. And I came in and he said, oh, I, I'm not going to do I can't learn with you today. I said, I didn't understand. Um, but I didn't come to learn with you. I came because it's Lagba Oimer that you should give my son a haircut. Wow. To take a snip of his hair. He's three years old today. Or two days ago, he was three years old. Come and take a snip of his hair on Lagba Oimer. And he was filled with energy. He said, oh, he said, a mitzvah, a mitzvah. And for this, he had, he had energy. Wow. That's what it means to do a mitzvah for the sake of the mitzvah. Okay, so when the good that is intermingled in the apple or in the activity, like cutting a child's hair, is separated from the selfishness, which is my appetite, I'm halishing for hunger, for, for thirst, for hunger. The story once about the Baal Shem Tov took one of his best Talmidim on Mozi Shabbos with no food and no, no nothing. And they walked and they walked and they walked. Said, where, you know, where, where are we going? How? They walked. He kept him going for days. And he was halish and Reb, I can't go on anymore. He says, but you have a moon that Hashem is going to send you food. What kind of test is that? Yes, Reb, yes, Reb. You say, so I'll have a moon. I have a moon and Hashem is going to, are you sure you really have a moon? Hashem is going to say, yes. Okay, so let's go. Keep, keep going. Hashem will send us. And, and he, he, he pushed him and pushed him and pushed him that Hashem is to have emuna, to have belief that Hashem is going to take care of them. And then when he could go no more, could no more go in Hashem, the Rebbe al Hashem said, we have to keep going a little bit more, a little bit more, and surely Hashem is going to send us. And comes along a farmer, and he's got water and, and refreshments for them. And he said, what are you doing? And, and he, he gave them the, the, the water and, the, and, the, and, the, and it gave them back their life. 
But the life that they got came from their emunah, from their belief that Hashem was sending this to them. And he said to the farmer, what are you doing here with this? He was, was, was a servant. He said, I don't know. Three days ago, my, my boss, the nobleman, told me to take this and go. And he didn't tell me where to go. He just said, take this and go. And three days I'm coming and now I meet you. Why did the boss tell him to do that? Well, the Baal Shem Tov set the whole thing up probably. But that's what it means that you do a thing for your emuna because you have emuna in, in God. That's how you do it. Then you, then you are able to take the life out of it and return it to its source. And Whereas if it, you just, it, and then he gives, okay, he gives an example in the last lines, we'll continue for her tomorrow. If a person eats a good meal, has a coffee, a cup of coffee, a yogurt, whatever, in order to pay attention in class and to uh, concentrate on the holy ideas from the Tanya that we're trying to learn, then that elevates the energy that we got from the coffee and from the yogurt or from the cottage cheese or whatever it was. If a person has meat, good fat, the juicy steak, and he drinks wine, a good fragrant wine, in order to have an expansive attitude and feeling about the Torah and about Hashem, then that elevates the energy within the meat and within the wine that it could be included in his energy when, with his, that he's using in order to teach Torah and to learn. He brings a quotation from the Talmud that... Uh, Rava said, wine and fragrance make me more receptive. It tells a story there how he, he, he got a certain case was presented to him and he couldn't, he couldn't judge the case. He couldn't come to the right answer. And the next day they brought the case back. He said, we'll talk about it tomorrow. Came back the next day. He answered the whole problem very easily. He said, what happened in between? He says, in between, I had a good meal. <laughs> that the sparks of holiness within the food gave him a deeper understanding, a clearer understanding of godliness, was able to come to the right conclusion. We'll continue to tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.